I'm Shruti from the Equals Project and today I'll be answering the web's most searched questions on the Indian Constitution. November 26th is Constitution Day. This is the day back in 1949 that the Constituent Assembly formally adopted the draft constitution. The Constituent Assembly had been through a three-year long process almost where there were three readings of the draft constitution. There were several amendments. I think estimates are there were about over 7,000 amendments tabled. At the end of this three-year process, they finally came up with the draft constitution that everybody was on board with and they formally adopted it. I think the motion says that the constitution as settled by this assembly be adopted. 26 November 1949 is the day that the constitution was adopted. Now, this used to be celebrated as Law Day till 2015. And then in 2015, the government passed a resolution saying that this would now be Constitution Day. So this is a slightly complicated question. I mean, officially, the Constituent Assembly of India drafted the Indian Constitution. The Constituent Assembly of India consisted of indirectly elected representatives. There were about 389 members before the partition, and the strength became 299 members after partition. And these were the people who were tasked with drafting the Indian Constitution. But as you can imagine, not all 299 of them wrote the draft of the Indian Constitution. There were several layers to drafting it. So in the first instance, there was a gentleman called B. N. Rao, who was the constitutional advisor. Now, he was a lawyer, an eminent jurist, and he was tasked with writing the first draft of the Indian Constitution. B. N. Rao then gave his draft to the drafting committee. The drafting committee consisted of seven men who were from the Constituent Assembly. And the chairman of the drafting committee was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. The drafting committee then took the draft presented by B. N. Rao, edited it, modified it, and they then presented it to the Constituent Assembly. The Constituent Assembly debated and discussed the Constitution over three years. Like I mentioned before, there were three readings of the draft Constitution, at the end of which the Constitution was adopted. So, in short, the Indian Constitution was written by the Constituent Assembly, it was written by the Drafting Committee, and it was written by the Constitutional Advisor. Now, there's no official title given to anyone, but Dr. B. R. Ambedkar is widely regarded as the father of the Indian Constitution. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was the chairman of the Drafting Committee and was heavily involved in drafting different provisions but also in outlining the values that would be embodied in the Indian constitution. There's a lot of writing on why this is important. Because Ambedkar's presence in the constitution and his key role in drafting the constitution shows emancipation of this newly independent country, not just from the British and the colonial power that was ruling us, but also a path forward from centuries-old hierarchies in India that were unequal and unjust. And that really is what Dr. Ambedkar, I think, tried to embody within the constitution. And that's why he's widely regarded as the father of the Indian constitution. He's also credited with speaking the most number of words in the Constituent Assembly. And a lot of the ideas and values in the constitution are undeniably driven by him. Yes, there are parts of the Indian constitution that are borrowed from other constitutions. So the idea of a preamble really comes from the constitution of the United States of America. The idea of directive principles of state policy is borrowed from the constitution of Ireland. The emergency powers that are there in the Indian constitution are borrowed from the constitution of Germany. So there are lots of parts of the Indian constitution that are inspired by other constitutions. And there's really some people who are upset about this in their constituent assembly, who accuse the drafting committee of plagiarism. But Dr. B. R. Ambedkar makes it clear that yes, the, there are parts that are borrowed, but this is not something to be ashamed of. And this doesn't negate the uniquely Indian spirit and content of the Indian constitution. He highlights that they are at a period in constitutional history where 
certain ground rules are established. There are certain ideas about what should be in a constitution. And that's what the Indian constitution has really borrowed from others. It's difficult to sort of define what all the constitution contains. I think we can think of the Indian constitution as containing different types of things. So one, the Indian constitution contains what are the values that underpin the Indian nation. So you can really think about the preamble as outlining that. We believe in liberty, in equality, in fraternity, in justice. So what are the values that define this nation? The second set of things that the uh, constitution really talks about is what kind of state do we want to be? Are we a democracy? Does everybody get to vote? What sort of rights do citizens have within a state? What's going to be the relationship between the citizen and the state? So defining what sort of state we're going to be. And the third bit is a lot of administrative things. I mean, these are really important administrative things. So what sort of federalism is going to be there in the state? What happens if two states enter into a dispute? Who adjudicates that? Uh, is there going to be an independent body to adjudicate these matters? What is the role of the judiciary? But if you were to broadly look at it, I think it contains the values that underpin this nation. It contains the type of nation and the, the relationship between the citizen and the state that we want to outline. And then it also lays out the administrative and procedural norms that will govern day-to-day -day administration or the broad framework of. So the word secular itself, which we see in the preamble, is only added in 1976 with the 42nd Amendment to the Constitution. But this doesn't mean that the notion of secularism isn't there in the Indian Constitution before that. So if you look at the Constituent Assembly debates, there's an assumption that secularism is a key cornerstone of what this new nation will be. There are several mentions of it. There's actually a motion by someone in the Constituent Assembly to add the word secular to the constitution. And this is rejected, not because the drafters didn't think India was going to be a secular nation, but because they thought this was a given, that of course we were going to be a secular nation and they didn't think it needed to be added. There are several references within the constituent assembly debates to secularism and the fact that India is a secular state. In her congratulatory message, when the constitution is adopted, Begum Aizaz Rasul says, oh, I'm so proud to have been part of this process and to have had a part in creating this new secular state. What the constituent assembly can't come to agreement about is what does secularism mean? Does secularism mean a complete separation of the state and religion? Does it mean equal acceptance of all religions? So to give you an example, there is a vigorous debate around the Uniform Civil Code. Now, there are those who argue that the right to religion means the right to practice your personal law in accordance with your religion. And that's what secularism is. Whereas other interpretations of secularism mandate that if you're a secular state, then you're not discriminating in personal or public life based on religion. And therefore, everyone should be subject to the same civil code. There's something that H.V. Kamath says in the Constituent Assembly, which is poignant, which he says, we're a secular state, but that doesn't mean we are a-religious or we're anti-religious. So there's this really this struggle between separating religion and the state, but also acknowledging that secularism and secular practice might need to be interpreted differently in the Indian nation. So yes, while the constitution makers definitely agreed that the Indian state was secular. What they didn't necessarily agree on was what the secularism meant for India. So the constitution came into force two months later on 26 January 1950, which is what we celebrate as Republic Day. Now, I mean, there's a symbolism to this. This is also Purnaswaraj Day, which is in the independence movement, 26 January was the day that within the freedom movement, they first asked for complete independence of India. And so it's 26 January is chosen to reflect that symbolism. 
Basically, what happens between 26 November 1949 and 26 January 1950 is the Constituent Assembly adopts it. The constitution is actually translated to Hindi within these two months. The Constituent Assembly meets in January of 1950 to sign the constitution and to officially register it. There's one member of the Constituent Assembly who refuses to sign it, but everyone else signs it. And then on 26 January, it officially comes into force and India becomes a constitutional republic. The Constitution of India can be amended. It's something that the Constitution framers discuss. And the procedure for amendment is laid out in Article 368 of the Constitution. I think so far there have been about 104 amendments to the Indian Constitution. But there is a limitation to this. In a landmark case called Keshav Nanda Bharati, the Supreme Court conceded that, of course, Parliament had the right to amend the Constitution. But it couldn't have alter certain fundamental parts of the constitution. This is called the basic structure of the Indian constitution. What this judgment does is it makes the constitution supreme in India, not parliament. Yes, there were 15 women in the constituent assembly. There was one Dalit woman, Dakshaini Velayudan from Kerala, and one Muslim woman, Begum Aizaz Rasul. There were other prominent women, including Vijayalakshmi Pandit, Sarojini Naidu, Hansa Mehta. And if you want to learn more about these 15 women, we did a podcast with BIC a few months ago, which you can check out on their website. If you want to learn more about the Constituent Assembly, you can read the Constituent Assembly debates online. Constitutionofindia.net does a great job of documenting it. There's a great TV series on Rajya Sabha TV called Samvitan. It's available in Hindi and English. Or you can follow us on Instagram. <laughs>